Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Fighting on Film. This week we are very lucky to be joined by Jim Dowdle, stunt performer, stunt coordinator, and he's had an incredible career and we are really looking forward to putting some of our listeners and supporting cast Patreon supporters questions to Jim. So Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Standing by. Yeah, it's um, it's fabulous for having you on. Like you're just looking at your credits list, there's there's something for everyone in there it's incredible like not just war movies but you know sci-fi classics the star wars the professionals like the long good friday the list is just huge you know i I was astounded with the amount of credits that you've got so i guess we should just kick off with a question so uh david patterson asks have you ever refused to do a stunt because it was too dangerous uh yes it was doubling peter o'toole on a, a thing called rogue mail for the bbc in the early 70s and uh, it was swinging between two castle towers in Wales. Oh, wow. And they wanted me to do it. It's a long story, but they wanted me to do it for real. And I said, you can't do that for real. You'll hurt, you know, that's not going to happen. I need to be rigged properly with a proper line on and I need a rigger up there. And they didn't send me the, they sent me a picture postcard of the, of the uh, that was the recce. They sent me a picture <laughs> postcard of these two towers and said, we want you to swing from one to the other with the rope back to this tower and you go from this tower. And I said, well, by the time I get here, I'm going to be doing about 30 miles an hour with no way of actually being able to break myself. So I either have to have a line off here, which would what we call a braille line to slow me down, or I need to have it from a center point so that I'm not, you know, so that I'm decelerating as I come in and you yeah. just, anyway. Wow. They said, "Well, we we can't afford that," and we didn't. You know, and I said, "Fine." But well, then I'm sorry, that's not me. And this is one of my first jobs. I mean, it was a big, a big deal. Um, but uh, they got a local guy up there to do it. Who was a uh, you know he didn't work very much because in those days transport wasn't like it is now. And some friends of mine who were working on the show said there was a lot of dialogue about, "Oh, well, those London stuntmen haven't got any bottle," and blah 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 blah. <laughs> He finished up breaking his pelvis, three rigs, uh, three ribs, fracturing his skull. And when they got him down, he was technically dead. They had to revive him and, and he never oh worked again. So I kind of think I made the right decision on yeah. that. Yeah, I suppose being being a stunt performer, I, one of the important things of the job is knowing when to say no. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. If you, if you can't be honest about your own skill set and you think that just sheer bottle is going to get you through that's yeah and you shouldn't be doing what you're doing you really shouldn't there are some there was you know a wonderful old performer no longer with us um who got killed doing a stunt and we used to call him fearless and um he was fearless but it overtook his common sense in the end i mean he was absolutely fearless Mm. but it killed him I suppose it's a, a good quality to have, but sometimes common sense is the better part of valour, isn't it? What we do is not, you know, I get a lot of people over the years have said, oh, I'm crazy, I'll have a go at anything, you know. Mm. I've got, and I, go, I wouldn't touch you with a barge bomb. Not interested. I need people who are skilled, who recognise what their skills are, to do a job which hopefully they're going to walk away from. And by definition, you can eliminate many of the problems that might come up to it but in the end it is still a stunt and you're still doing something which is physically unnatural to do without the lure of a 50 pound note at the end of it so Mm. uh, you've got to know your own limitations otherwise you know you're not going to you know you're going to be in hospital all the time i mean you know evil can evil was a wonderful example if everybody said oh he's a great stunt man he's broken every bone in his body well that just means to me he's just screwed up so many times he should have possibly been looking for a job as an accountant. You know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. David Patterson also asks, uh, who was the best actor in a war film to work with from a stuntman's point of view? Gosh, that's very, that's very difficult because it, it, the reason we're there is to look after those actors and to double them to mm. make sure that they don't 
get injured in any way. And the only person who can, I can say, definitely does a lot of his own stunts, which cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, is Tom Cruise, because mm-hmm. he produces those, and he wants, he you know, he wants to do those things himself. But if you see Tom Cruise thrown by an explosion against a car, they've spent hundreds of thousands or certainly tens of thousands of dollars on a rubber car just for that shot. So he's not going to hurt himself when he hits the car. Mm. Well, you can't do that on a normal production. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that, you know? Um, so you have to, you have to um, cut your cloth, but uh, I mean, who's the best person I work for? I mean, I doubled Harrison Ford on, on Hanover street and things and, but he would say, no, that's you, mate. Off you go. <laughs> and yeah. I would do it, you know. So, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. There's no point in bravado. And then the actor breaks his foot or his leg or his arm or concusses himself and everybody else is put out of work. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say it's everyone else's job, isn't it? As well as theirs. Mm. So going back a little bit, we got a question from Adam Brown and he asks, what was Jim doing before he became Lee Marvin's stunt double? I suppose he's talking about the dirty dozen there. Okay, I was never. This is uh, the, this is complete nonsense. I was never Lee Marvin's stunt double. Okay. Well, there we go. We played that up anyway. Yeah. Well, my first job was in the film business was as an armorer, right? And working with guns. So I worked on the Dirty Dozen, which was my first first film, mm-hmm. and I worked with Lee Marvin as the armorer, not as a stuntman right. on that okay. film. Um, and I had a very interesting time with him because I was a young lad. I was 18 and, and I got, I was told to go around and show the actors what guns they would be using during the film. And I'd already been to Charles Bronson and Donald Sutherland and, and John, Charles Bronson, which is very rude. He said, I know how to fire a gun kid, piss off. So, okay. And I went to Lee Marvin's room. This is at the old MGM studios in Elster, which is now long gone. And uh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and I go in there and he's sitting there with a half bottle of Jack Daniels and a cigar on a tripod, you know, and his feet up <laughs> waiting. And, and I come in with this gun and he said, oh, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm Jim, the assistant armourer, and I come to show you the, the weapons you'll be using on the film. <laughs> he said, OK, kid, do your thing. So I, I did the whole page one. You are an actor who's never fired a gun before and I'm going to treat you like a 24 karat crap. <laughs> And so I start telling him about this, particular the M3 grease gun, and and he's nodding his head, very knowledgeable. And mm, okay, yeah, yeah, I said, and I'm going, yeah, you've got to be very careful because the empty cases come out the side, and they can hit people, and they're hot, and blah 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 blah. And he remember he's sitting down, so he's looking up at me, so my eye line is down at him, and he puts his arms out and he takes the weapon off me, and he's now talking to me, and he strips it down without looking at it. <laughs> and puts That's it on amazing. its component parts on the table and then looks down at it and I look down at it. Okay, and then he ca- and then he looks up again and continues the conversation and then puts it all back together again, effectively blindfolded, and then hands it back to me and I go, right, <clears throat> and move on. Um, not realising that he was in the Marine Corps during the war, he was wounded, he was decorated, and he's a gun nut. Yeah. But... It's, it proved to be a, a most interesting relationship. I had a huge amount of time for him. We used to sit and chat about guns. And for a guy of his age to be talking to an 18-year-old who was as green as green, you know, the first movie. But we would talk yeah. guns, and, and it was great. And 20 years later, we were doing The Dirty Dozen Next Mission, and I was a stuntman by then. And I came on that movie to do a, a motorbike crash. Okay. Oh, another one. Yeah, we covered it at Christmas. <laughs> we did. Oh, did you? Yeah, we did. We right. did Dirty Dozen December. We did them all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I did one. I turned a motorbike and sidecar over. One of the best bits of that film. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just came in to do two or three days, and and that was one of the part of the chase sequence, and 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 that was the end of it. Bang! Obviously, I, when I turned the flip the thing over, I could go home, and that was that. Thanks and good night. But he was there. And this is 20 years later, and it's in the winter, and we're all cold, and I've, I've now got a German uniform with a hat and a you know, helmet, and, and I'm going into the dining bus to have, eat my breakfast. And I can feel somebody's eyes. I mean, I look down to the end of the dining bus, and there's Marvin, and he looks at me, 
and he does that as though he was cocking the gun as he did <laughs> you know 20 plus years ago and then he pointed his finger and he said it's you isn't it and i've never felt so i felt 10 feet tall at that point that he should have That's recognized lovely. that he'd remember yeah wow. yeah 20 years later and i was i was in a completely different department in those days but it, it was a it was a mark of, of um the, i had great respect for him he was a yeah. top man as mm. far as i'm concerned I mean, that's amazing. Like, what? <laughs> Just incredible, incredible stuff. Oh, so our next question is from Jamie D. And he asks, I know it's a very boring question that I'm sure Jim hears a lot, but which of the war films he's been involved in was his favourite to work on and why? Um, definitely uh, The Eagle Has Landed because I played one of Michael Caine's paratroopers. So I was in it right from word the word go. It was a beautiful summer of 1976. Where the sun just we we were we went to Finland and did the Russian scenes out there in the snow, and then we came back and we went to Cornwall and we did the stuff um, down there with with uh, the the uh, the German torpedo boat and and uh, I've forgotten the actor's name now. Wonderful old actor who played the uh, the the, the uh, German officer who is put up a wall and executed. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. Anyway. And we had a lovely time in Cornwall and um, I drove my, I, you know, I've got an old World War II Jeep and I drove that down there and I had my dog with me and had a wonderful couple of three weeks down there. And then we came back to Maple Durham where we took over the whole village. Yeah. And, we were, uh, and I took a room for, with somebody in the village and uh, where the water mill was. And so I could have my dog with me and, uh, you know, walk out of the front door and I was on the set. I didn't have to go anywhere in the evenings. The caterers kept on saying, we'll have some strawberries or smoked salmon or whatever at the end of the day. We were 200 yards from the Thames. It was so hot. I could go swimming, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and come back and sit in the garden and think I'm getting paid very generously for it and have my Jeep on it at that point. So I was getting paid. A rental fee for my Jeep. The, the, everybody on that film was just wonderful. The lovely stunt guys who became friends for life, Nick Hobbs and people. Um, and genuinely a fabulous, fabulous time. I mean, it was just three months of, I couldn't believe I was getting paid. What was Michael Caine like to work with? Great. I mean, I've done three or four films with him since. And you're just very polite. He's just a nice man. You know, there's no... Mm. Pretensions. There's sadly, there's an awful lot of to, if you'll pardon the, friend, the phrase, think their shit doesn't smell and they can walk on water, because they are, you know, think that they're, they're uh, le grand fromage, and actually they're nothing without all those people around them, all those technicians and all those the, uh, us lot that make it, make them look good, if you like, and I and I always. Um, I hate that really, and I learned very early on. I, I, um, it wasn't a war film, but I, when I was at Armourer, I got a, a request to go down to Twickenham Studios to do a job with real bullets, and I, I didn't know what the job was. I wasn't really interested. I was a rocker in those days. I had a big leather jacket and a, you know, bugger off motorbike and all the things, and and uh, long hair, no tattoos in those days. Or scrap iron through your nose and your ears like there is now. But um, <clears throat> and I went down to the studios and they took me onto the stage and they said, "We want you to shoot a couple of holes in a painting of a woman on the wall." It was it was a Victorian set about nineteen hundred interior of a castle, and I didn't know what the film was. They were filming on another set, so I spent the morning putting up a bullet catcher and. Um, and uh, in, in, at lunchtime, uh, the assistant came and said, right, we're going to go upstairs and we're going to meet Mr. Olivier, um, who is the director, producer and the star of this film. You will refer to him as Sir Lawrence and you will speak when you're spoken to. <laughs> now, you have to understand that in the 60s, Lawrence Olivier was probably the most famous actor in the world. He was, the, yeah. I think at that point, the only knighted British actor, long before Alec Guinness and all those people got their knighthoods and was a legend, I mean, really a legend. So I get taken up to his dressing room and I'm, in, I'm seriously in awe, A-W-E, awe. And I, get, I go into the dressing room, he gets up, comes over and shakes hands, hello, my name's Lawrence Olivier. 
Thank you very much for coming. As if I, I mean, Laurence Olivier, right? This is the organ grinder talking to the monkey, isn't it? You know, um, <laughs> and uh, and he says, I play the colonel of an Austrian cavalry regiment whose wife is having an affair with a young officer and I can't do anything about it. And in frustration, I go down to my study and um, I shoot holes in the, her painting on the wall. Right. He said, and, you know, I don't want squibs. I don't want the explosive squibs because they're going to tear and a bullet going through canvas just makes a neat hole. Now you do it yeah. in 30 seconds on a computer. But he said, but so I want real bullets. Okay, fine. I said, it's all set up for that. And he said, well, do you think there's any way, I mean, we were going to do it just as a, as a, as a pickup shot, as a, as a solo, um, but mm. is there any way that we could do it with me in a shot as well? Now, now this is him now talking to me, 18-year-old rocker with long hair, and asking me a question. And I think I was a bit cocky at the time, but I was very sure that I was, I was could be safe with it. And for live ammunition jobs, I used to use a Model 38 Beretta submachine gun, which was like a small rifle, but it had single shot and full auto. So you could, you, you could aim very accurately with it, with a 9 mil round. So I said, yeah, if I stand on a ladder behind the cameras or I could shoot over your left shoulder and because you'll have the back to camera, as you fu before you fire the blank, you say three, two, one, bang, you fire the blank and I'll put the round over your shot. Now I'm proposing firing a live nine millimeter round three feet from the, from the left ear of the biggest actor in the world. And he said, do you think it's safe? And I said, yeah, fine, as long as you put a bit of wax in your ear because there'll be a bit of a bang, you know. Okay, so we go down on the set and we get it all set up. And and he says to everybody, so give this young man whatever he needs, please, blah, blah, blah. We do it. We set it all up. One take, done, bang. Comes over and shakes hands and said, thank you very much, young man. That was that was your idea. We couldn't have done that without you. Now, that actually is what the film business is all about. It's about teamwork, about everybody putting their mm. five bobs worth in to make the shot work better. And that's why whenever I, you know, I get actors who really do think that they're some special because they're the actor and everybody recognises them. I kind of want to tell them that story and say, you know, you, if you walk down Oxford Street and you said your lines in the middle of Oxford Street in the rush, everybody would be going, get the hell out of my way, right? Yeah. It's only when you're surrounded with all the lights and the panoply and the publicity people and blah, 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 suddenly you become a, a completely different entity. Anyway, that's the end of my, my rant about overwhelmingly um self-indulgent actors moving swiftly on right next. <laughs> yeah. next question matt well one from me jim how did you get into that world i know you mentioned you were an armor beforehand but what gave you that background to get into being an armor and then what made you make the jump from armor to being a stunt performer okay very briefly i left school at 16 i joined the circus from bertram mill circus as a roustabout and i because i was sussex schoolboys gymnastics champion at one point that was my thing, you know. I was never right. going to be a, a, an academic as long as I had a hole in my ass. But uh -huh. um, <laughs> uh, 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 that was my my thing was was gymnastics and all that. So I joined circus and I I, I was you know just helping looking after the animals. I worked for a lion trainer called Gerd Simeone, looking after the big cats. And then I used to do a little bit of stuff in the arena with them with the clowns. I wasn't a clown, but they used to have us sort of try to fix things up and they would come and trip us up and do all that sort of stuff. So there was a little bit of performance going right. on. Anyway, yeah. I did that for a while and then I left and I worked in a motorcycle company and then I worked in a car for a car company and worked at Harrods over Christmas, drove a cab, uh, all that. And then I joined the army, I joined the parachute regiment. And uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to do seven years in doing this. And my dad was at Arnhem and da da da. Um, and I got invalided out he? after 19 months with three impacted vertebrae from a night oh, jump. And um, so I came out in 71, late 71. And I thought, okay, I've worked with all these stunt guys um, uh, beforehand, you know, in the, in the 60s on those films. And, I, you know, there was, it wasn't just the Dirty Dozen, it was Where Eagles Dare. Yeah. Attack on the Iron Coast, Submarine X, Mosquito Squadron, all those pictures I'd worked on as an armor. And I'd, so I kept on meeting the same stuntmen. And I thought, that's this is the way I want to go. So then I spent nearly two years getting my equity card, which in those days was a real, really difficult thing. Now you need one contract and, and you pay your thing and you're an equity member because they're, right. they're much more interested in your, getting your sub than they are in actually 
finding out whether you've actually done what needed to be done. But in those days, it was a very valuable. So I got my equity card. And then in 1973, they formed the stunt register. And the stunt, but previously, guys doing stunts used to be extras. And they'd say, well, who wants to fall down the flight of stairs today? Or whatever it was. And there was no delineation. And at that point, we said, we will do the stunts and they will do the extra work. We won't do extra work and they won't do stunts. So that's why we formed the stunt register in 1973 and I got onto it from the bottom rung and here we all are. If I was a horse, they'd have shot me by now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I watched uh, the Hollywood Bulldogs documentary uh, about stunt, stunt men and that, that whole yeah. era. And, and I found that part about the, the register really, really interesting in the way that it, it grew out of the necessity to have some people that were more qualified than just extras and then how it evolved over time. I thought, I thought all of that was really interesting. So just to go back, because we can't skip over it. What was working on um, Where Eagles Dare like? I have to ask. That was fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, we went off to Austria for two and a half months. Um, working with Yakima Kanat, for instance, who was the, the second unit director, who was the most famous. I mean, he was the only stuntman who ever got an Oscar. He was the most famous stuntman in the world. And, and, and a marvellous guy. He became sort of not a friend but I used to go and see him regularly I used to go to LA a lot in the old days and you know for various reasons and I used to go and you know see Yak and sit down and talk to him and I mean, this is a man who won he was a world champion rodeo rider three years in a row nobody's ever done that you know and this was a man who was as uh, you know humility was his middle name he never never talked about himself unless you asked him and there on the, on his shelf is his Oscar propping up the gas bill. You know, I mean, it was just <laughs> it was just a light. So working with him was was extraordinary. Um, uh, Clint Eastwood bought three Norton Commando motorcycles, uh, one for himself, one for James Garner, and one for Steve McQueen. Wow, that was the latest thing, and he wanted some miles to put on them. And there weren't many guys around in those days who wanted cars. Nobody had motorcycles very much. And he said, you know, does anybody want to help me put some miles on it? So I used to go and meet him in the studio. And we used to go and ride <laughs> out on Sunday, just ride these Nortons about, you know. Incredible. I, 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 I can't believe, I, mean, I just couldn't what believe What a dream. It. Obviously, I wasn't getting paid, but I was you know, riding the most modern motorcycle available, which I could never afforded. He's going to turn that down. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. And then, you know, we had all that stuff out in Austria and then we came back and shot in the studio here for, for another six weeks or, you know, and Richard Burton was there. Elizabeth Burt Taylor used to come in and, and pick him up in the evenings when he was pissed as a fart by then. Um, and uh, it was extraordinary. It was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. It's a great, great film to work on. Sounds Can you remember? And, and, and I got killed by, by um, Clint Eastwood in the corridor sequence. I was. That's what I was about to ask. So you, you know that corridor sequence. Who whose idea was the dual wielding of the MP40s? Oh, that was him. That was that was Clint. Was it? Amazing. And yeah, and and uh, the, the, the Brian Hutton, the director, said, "Yeah, great. Yeah, why not? Absolutely. You know, it's all about." It's iconic. It when the dollar films came out, I mean, it's just such a of old bollocks the whole film really um, <laughs> it, is, it is but it's great fun it's a classic isn't it yeah yeah it is absolutely but at one point in the corridor sequence you see two guys run in with a, an mg42 on a tripod yeah, and yeah. i'm the gunner oh and wow. I, every time i see it, i look at myself age 18 getting killed by clint eastwood and i got paid more money for that one day than i did for a week and a half being an armorer and i thought hmm this is interesting mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> it's interesting it was great yeah. fun. It's, I mean, it sounds like you see what a life you've had. This amazing, like, and moving on to our next question. Uh, David Lawton asks, um, which stunt has been your favourite to, to make or work or do? I would imagine that's really hard to I answer. I imagine that, yeah. I mean, our patrons are a bit mean with some of these. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's unfortunately, it's not to do with what is you're talking about on war movies. It, or it just, doesn't matter. Or, it's, it can be any, we career. don't mind. It's your choice, isn't it? I did a whole load of, of films for the Irish government, some road safety films, where they said, we don't want a stunt, we want an accident. Right. We want people to go, oh, shit, I'm not going to yeah. do that. I, I remember very vividly being shown these films <laughs> Me in, too. In, in primary and high school for road safety lessons. And they, yeah. they made a point well, of going, these aren't British, these are Irish. 
Oh, you saw the Irish ones because they wouldn't show them on TV too. Here, they said they they were too they were too gritty and they would shock yeah. people. And you think, hang on, that's the idea. <laughs> that's isn't what it? they're meant to do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and we did a whole series on them for about seventeen or eighteen years. The whole load of, on my website actually. I'm, yeah, uh, I watched them. them. Uh, some um, flashbacks I got from them, like because I think <laughs> they showed us them at school when my dad had a Harley, and I used to be on the back of it. My dad was safe as they come, like driving that thing with me on the back of it, like no, no worries at all. But it scared me shitless. I got to admit, like it's just so like the realism in those are so affecting. That was the you know? idea. That yeah, was of the course, idea. yeah. To make people like your dad go, mm, yeah, maybe I'll just you know, whatever, or you to be sitting there going, you know what, I'm not going to text when I'm crossing the road. I'm just going to yeah, exactly. cross the road yeah. and text it. And all that. So those ones which were accidents, not stunts, they had to be convincing that it, it was not something that was, was dramatic. It was, a, it was definitely an accident, quote, unquote. And those were, frankly, the most, A, they were extremely challenging, not only from the fact that, we, that what we were trying to do, but we had a tiny budget in comparison to, I mean, one road death costs the country in those days when we were making those films 10 years ago was what something like 1.3 million wow. with everything, with road closures and you know, insurance payouts, people having to be retrained for jobs, kids orphaned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The whole thing rolls for 1.3 million, but they would give us, 60,000 or something to make that film. And I said, you give us the equivalent of what, one death is costing, we could make a series of films that would really make people say, but it doesn't work like that, fortunately, with the government. Yeah. Very frustrating. We'd get, mm. it was one car. And so you got, we've got one car. We've got to make it work for the crash because we haven't got a second chance at it. Whereas if you were on a, a, a normal film or certainly on a bond, you'd have six of them lined up there. Yeah. You might only use one, but there were six that were ready. Wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're so affecting even now, like they, they stick in your mind. That's the worst thing about them. And the best, probably the best thing about them actually is that they do stick in your head. Um, so my question for you is, is there a film, it doesn't have to be a war film, um, because you, your career is just so interesting. Um, is there a film you regret not working on? Uh, yes, I think Kelly's Heroes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, and my. I was doing a film... Um, I think we were doing either the bridge at Remagen or some other film, and I couldn't, I couldn't get off it. And they'd asked because it, they wanted to get as many people back from Eagles Dare, mm. and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I'd love to work. I mean, that was a, just a super, another superb film, you know. And you know, sadly, Brian Hutton, who was the director, did about two or three more films, and then left the film business and became a plumber. Do you know that? Wow, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. No, he became a plumber. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh! Wow. wow. Yeah, just packed. Oh, how many baths have been put in by a, by the one of the greats? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, but that that would be my regret. Or maybe, maybe it was you can't win them all. Maybe it's because I was doing you can't win them all, which was a film with Tony Curtis and Charles Bronson that we did out in Turkey, which is an absolute pile of shit. Oh, that's the um, that's the uh, Greeks. Gre- it's a Greek civil war film. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it was directed by Peter Collinson, who directed the original one with a great car chase in it with, with Michael Caine. Um, oh. The Italian job? The Italian job. Thank you. Sorry, the brain's not go. working properly. Yes. <clears throat> and that was the same director. But, I mean, you can't win them all. It's an absolute piece of junk. I've seen the trailer. I want to watch it. I've seen the trailer. I was saying yeah. to Rob the other day. This looks yeah, like this problem. is a conflict that you never see in film. It looks yeah. really interesting. There's a decent cast to it, but... There's something about some of these scenes that don't look. No, no, it was too yeah. rubbish. It was rubbish. <laughs> no. rubbish. Uh, and I worked very. It was it was it was hard work. Very hot out there, mm. and you know guns are not made to fire blanks, and they misbehave when they get very hot. Mm. Yes, and there's a great deal of misbehaviour, but that's another story. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. So our next uh, next question is from Nick LaHurry, and he asks, what is the most difficult stunt you've done? Oh, God, I get asked that all the time, you know, and it's, it's it's very tricky because people imagine that it's going to be something where you fly off the top of a building on fire with 
with you know firing a gun and all that kind of stuff and that's not necessarily the case at all and uh, years ago i had to do a thing where i had to fall back into a coffin and then the lid slammed shut and it was a real coffin and if the coffin if i'd moved sideways or stood on tiptoes i went in i could have either taken the top of the, my head or like a boiled egg or smashed both my either of my elbows you know and uh, you think that's a nothing stunt. It's absolutely stunt. Yeah. But actually, it was only when I got there and I thought, oh God. And I mean, now you wouldn't do it with a real cotton. You know, it would be made out of cardboard. And, you know, if you got it wrong, they'd just bring the next cardboard one in. But, it, you know, it was a five-ball production and they got a real coffin. So it's little things like that, or where you've got to, um, you've got to swing across something and you, 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 you've got to get across there because if you, don't get across there and you come back into the middle you're not going to have enough velocity to get back to where you took off from and then suddenly you're going to be hanging there on the rope because what they, mm. they want you to do is to is to is to swing across the gap and then get off the rope and run so you can't be harnessed on but if you don't get over there all the way and you're left hanging there and there isn't enough rope you're going to drop and if you're on a location with a river down below you you can't put boxes or an airbag down there so you've got to actually do it. Now, look, when you look at it, then people go, oh, Tarzan did that in every movie he did. <laughs> but you can see occasionally um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great uh, TV show made in the 70s um, just called Hollywood. And there's one, ep one, a lot of it was all about stunts. It's called Hazard of the Game. I don't know whether you guys have ever seen it. It's well worth a look. No. It's on YouTube. I, have to look it I up. think there is a sequence in one of the silent movies of a guy doing a Tarzan thing and he gets it wrong and he, <laughs> he doesn't get hold of the rope and oh, down gosh. he goes. And that, that, that guy, clappers on end, he's probably broken both his legs and, and you know, da, 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 right, bring on the next stuntman. It was a very different world in those days. But silly little things like that are the risky ones. If you're going to turn a car over on fire, you've had a day to rehearse it you're in a you in your fire suit you've got a helmet you've got a roll cage you've got firemen you've got your mates around you you've got this that and the other it's actually technically although it's a lot more spectacular it's a great deal more safety factors built into that than there is on a silly little gag like i just mentioned yeah that makes sense so it's, a difficult, yeah. it's a difficult question it's slightly how long is a piece of string but yeah of course so um andrew cg asks um you started doing stunt work in in the in, in the late sixties, early seventies, and then you moved into stunt coordination. From from Andrew's question, what I'm wondering is, what are the the technicalities of moving into that kind of world? Because you've got all that experience of actually performing the stunts, but then you have to sort of know how to make them happen and make them look how the director wants. What are the kind of challenges for that? As you get as you get older and more experienced, and you realise that that you, you do have it and you understand what a coordinator's job is. In those days, you could coordinate and perform on the same film. Now, if you're a coordinator, you coordinate. You stay behind the camera, you right. write the risk assessment, and, mm. uh, and all your guys go out there and, and do the gags. But in those days, you could pick and choose. If, if it was your film, you could say, all right, well, I'll do the car turnover or the, the fire job and everything else, and that will enhance my feet. But my first real coordinating job i was doing some some road safety commercials for a lovely director called bob mahoney and it was those those days it was the hammer and the peach and don't take your car for a drink and clunk click every trip you're too young you probably won't remember those i've seen i've seen them like you know just out of curiosity i think they were of their time in the 70s and i was doing one where it was, which was about cyclists and how vulnerable they are and how a cyclist pedalling along the road, if there's a Coke can, he's going to swing out to avoid it because that can mm -hmm. swim off his bike. And then you see the car just running over the Coke can and squashing it and then ignoring it completely. And it was about, that's what it was all about. And it was it called gun sight. And you have a, they put a gun sight on the windscreen and they're looking through the windscreen and you've seen these cyclists. And, else. and the director said, um, I need you to, I'm going to put the camera in the gutter and have the Coke can there and I, I need you to run over it. He said, how many times you know how many goes at it will you have to have before you run over it and i said one i can do that that's what i do and he said no you won't i said yeah so bang i ran over the the coke can and the next 
series of commercials did, he rang me up and he said, I'd like you to coordinate it rather than the other guy, which was a bit tricky because the other guy had put me in, lovely, lovely guy, dead now. But he was a, you know, he, was, he, he used to do all that guy's work. And after that, I used to do all Bob's work and we went all over the place, including a, a very interesting time going to Zambia doing a commercial where I had to get charged by Rhino and then I hung out over at, at, underneath a helicopter filming the Rhino. And I mean, now you do all that in post-production, but we did it for real with a proper Rhino and and all that with Bob Mahoney. And we, we, you know, we had some extraordinary times and blew things up in Spain on a, on a, on another commercial and, I drove a, a car through a burning house for him and did all sorts of things. So, um, sorry, that was taking me back. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're loving it. The, the, my, my basic question was, what what's actually involved with stunt coordination? How how does that work? What's the the, the relationship okay. between so, a, a stunt coordinator and the director? That kind of thing. So you are the director's man at that point. He says to you, "Here's my script. Here's my vision of how I want this to appear." And the producer says, and here's my budget. You've got to produce that within that budget. Right. Yeah. Or you go and give them a budget and the guy's, you know, you're 50,000 an hour. I'm sorry, I haven't got that. So you've got to then rein that in to, to give them what they want. And then it's as a, as a coordinator, then it's down to me to A, look at the locations, B, work out what needs to be done, C, work out the doubles, and D, to then ring the performers up who I think are going to be right for the job. And now, of course, in the last 20 years, E is to write an effing risk assessment. Yeah. Which is a whole nother ball game. Much more involved than anyone could possibly imagine from just watching the stunt. Yes, there is. There's a huge amount of paperwork. And, and sadly, there's an awful lot of health and safety people who are, uh, you know, have, a, have got a qualification because they've studied something for two years. And they know, they, they don't actually know shit from toothpaste when it comes to knowing how a stunt works, but they have mm. got all the ticks in the boxes. And yeah. they are very often now coming to me and saying, well, you can't do this, that's dangerous. And I go, hang on, this is a stunt, mate. You know, but if you yeah, want to do it, business. I'll go home and <laughs> I'll just pay them a bill and you can do it, you know, because I <laughs> yeah. clearly know more about it than I do. It's very frustrating. Mm. Some people Sounds are great. Some health and safety people I work with for years are fantastic, and and we work. But a, a lot of them are obsessed, rather like the whole COVID thing. I mean, on the recent um, uh, Tom Hanks series about uh, the US Eighth Air Force, mm -hmm. is just finished. They had something like thirty-two COVID monitors. Wow! Who'd got you know unbelievable powers? You know, no, no, you must stand to. I suppose it's all factored in with insurance mm. and stuff like that, mm. isn't and it? On all that, and the health and safety people are, are you know, they 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 mean well, but they anyway, uh, another story. I suppose with with health and safety people, it the the more they know about how stunt performers work and what goes into them and how it's done, the more I don't know if if they're if, if they're in the right space of mind, that the more amiable they are to to having things done. I suppose if they're worried about just ticking the boxes, then it's it depends very much who they're working for. The BBC have got such enormous restrictions now because there's a there's a there's an inbuilt paranoia is probably a bit too strong. But you know, with everything else that's happened with the BBC, they spend a lot of money on what would twenty years ago have been a, a relatively simple thing. They are boxing it up to try and make it. In any way, if they can get away with not turning the car over and just do noises off, they will do that. Right. Time mm. Because there is a genuine fear about, you know, producers being sued and all that right. kind of stuff and uh, so on and so forth. So we're in a different arena now mm -hmm. from the point of view of creativity in many respects. You know, it, it doesn't all work like Mission Impossible where Tom Cruise has got the the whip hand and they can you know spend lots and lots and lots of money on on stuff now it's all about budgets and about how you can cut it down rather than enhance it that's what i found anyway i see just to loop back a little bit you mentioned the, the new tom hanks series um i think it's masters of the air yeah um, have you have you done some coordination work on that no or? i didn't know a mate of mine did it and he asked me to come and do a few days working on it as a performer but i was 
uh, fortunately very busy when all that was going on, doing a lot of commercials for Jaguar Land Rover and people, and and uh, and I'd love to have worked on it. I mean, I yeah. absolutely love to worked on it. Having worked on Private Ryan, and then um, I was asked to go up for the job of Band of Brothers, and I was in the middle of doing a film up in, I think I was doing either Captain Corelli's Mandolin or 51st State or something, and I couldn't actually get down for the interview. And oh, a mate of mine, Richard Longhorn, was, 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 was directing the first um, action episode on it and everything. And I mean, it, it really, it, it, it dovetailed perfectly with what, you know, being ex-military and I collect World War II military vehicles and, you know, I've had tanks and, Blah blah. I mean, it was just so right up my my street, mm. but I couldn't make the interview. And Mary Richards was the producer, and I would worked for her as the stunt coordinator on the Borrowers, and I got on really well with her. And she'd asked me to come in, and I just couldn't make the interview, and that was that. So, no. I mean, Greg Powell did a great job of it. He did a fantastic job of the whole series. He yeah. really did. But I'd love to have been doing it. And because they wanted to get it right, and the same way that they did on Private Ryan, you know, Private Ryan was was just the best in terms of historical accuracy. And particularly, you know, my particular thing is World War II, and as I say, I collect the vehicles, and I know about the guns, and I know about the uniforms, and I, I've been to Normandy more times than I can remember over the years on or in military vehicles. You know, I used to have an amphibious duck, one of those oh, great big, yeah, yeah, and I'm oh, cool. channeling it for the 50th anniversary. Oh, amazing! E Day with my Harley Davidson military Harley Davidson on the back deck, you know, love it. Um, and I remember it was, that being on the BBC coverage. Oh, did you? I oh, think well, so. Yeah, go. yeah. So to work on Private Ryan was an absolute. It was a real pleasure. I was too old to be an SS soldier, so I was driving the half track that when when Ryan bazookas the half track when they first meet him which is part of the reason I think I'm deaf now. Um, <laughs> and uh, I drove the, the, the tank at one point and I drove two of the other tanks that got blown up. I just seemed to be getting blown up all the time, which is <laughs> fine, but I, you know, I couldn't be seen as a, as a trooper. But it, uh, again, Tom Hanks was a, a delightful man, delightful man. And at one point I'm driving the Tiger when they blow the track off and I'm just moving it forward a few feet and then he comes up and he fires his Tommy gun through the, the vision slit. Was that you on the receiving end of that Thompson? Yes. Oh, well, oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And he was very concerned. He said, are you going to be all right? And all that. Don't, I said, don't worry. By the time you, the muzzle of that comes, I'm going to be on the floor. But I had wax in my ears and then, you know, hearing protectors. And then I wrapped a big scarf around myself. I look, I, I look like a member of ISIS on, on steroids. And... Um, <laughs> But still, the noise inside that with a forty-five caliber, absolutely dead. So at the end of that, having done all those bangs and crashes, I, I definitely was kind of, you know, my hearing has taken a lot of punishment over the years. I bet it has. Because in those days, in the old days, again, you didn't have the kind of ear valves that you have now, which uh, you go over a certain decibel level and they cut off. Mm. You had ear plugs, which meant that you couldn't hear the you couldn't hear the uh, the cues. Yeah. So you had to somehow be able to have the, now it's very much easier. You know, you have these ones and, and if it goes over 130 decibels, they block. That's great. But, you know, uh, again, in that sequence where the tank is coming along and they throw the Molotov cocktails into the back and I'm driving the tank. And I thought if he gets it wrong, that's going to come in on me because the, there was no, you could see for, for, in the driver's hatch, I could see air. So if it was going to be petrol, it was going to come through. So I, I put my fire suit on and I had a little fire extinguisher there. But Simon, the stunt coordinator, said, whatever you do, when that, when that fire hits, he said, don't stop, roll forward and stop about 10 or 15 feet away. So when it came, one of them hit on the edge and the fire came down into the thing and it's now dripping liquid stuff into my crotch. Oh, my gosh. Which is quite interesting, which is icy cold because it's CO2. <laughs> so I've gone from heat to icy cold, and I'm still having to aim the tank to stop it, you know, where Simon had said that it should finish, trying to put my family allowance out, you know, on the on the thing. It's interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that sequence, it's one of the more like, 
iconic shots from that bat from that town battle. Yeah. It looks great, you know, to look, to know you're not only have you been shot at by Tom Hanks, but you were driving that tank. You took some punishment on that shoot. I mean, gosh. Yes, I did, yeah. But I okay, Simon was very generous with it. He gave us what we call stunt adjustments, which you get for featured stunts and all that. And you know, so oh, I could always rub the embrication on with a 50 pound note afterwards. You know? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I mean, going back to something you said earlier, um, we were at the tank museum earlier in the year for their Fury event. Um, and you mentioned your Harley there. Now, we, we heard in passing from um, David Willey, the, the curator, that you sold Brad Pitt a Harley Davidson. Is that true? <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. On the first day on Fury, um, my I had my military Harley as a bit of set dressing. You know, a mate of mine mm-hmm. riding all the vehicles. He said, bring your Harley down. He said, I'll give you a few quid for it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it turned up on the set. And don't forget, I've been working with them, with the tanks, training them for two or yeah. three weeks. So yeah. we now it's the first day of filming and the pressure is on. So Brad is in the tank, just uh, just coming past me. He says, stop, stop, stop. And I'm standing near the bike. And he said, who owns that bike? And I said, uh, I do. And he said, uh, can it be bought? I went, no. He said, why not? I said, because I've had the bike since 1970. I've done thousands of miles all around the battlefields. I've rebuilt it. I know every nut and bolt on it. And even you, Brad Pitt, haven't got enough money for that bike. <laughs> So he laughed and we moved on. The next day he said, have you changed your mind? And I said, which bit of piss off did you miss yesterday? (laughs) Thinking that maybe I might have actually blown it. But actually we had a long chat because he said, you know, at some point he said, I I do like bikes and I like that bike because it it doesn't look brand new out of a crate like so many people over restore them. It looks Mm -hmm. ridden. You know, and I haven't put a lick of paint on that bike in 25 years. And I, I, you know, I was out on it yesterday, and it looks like yeah. a, war, a war-worn bike. And uh, and I said, well, no, you're not going to buy that one, but I'll find one for you. So I, I rang around various people, and I found one very similar again that had a patina about it. It didn't look like an over-restored, out of the crate machine. That's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> we, we heard that, and we were like, oh, if, if we get Jim, and we've got to ask him about how that came <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah, I didn't realise that I'd, I'd I'd spoken to David about that. Actually, he obviously I must have done. That. Oh, he was singing singing your praises um, very highly on, on the event. Oh, well, that's good to know. I must send him another fiver. <laughs> Fantastic. So I think Matt, you've got the final question from Paul Hicks. Yeah, Paul asks, "What was the most elaborate action sequence you were part of?" Elaborate. Well, wow, that's a wonderful word. We had some quite tricky battle sequences on. Captain Corelli. We had a very tricky battle sequence on Richard the Third. Funnily enough, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know whether you remember that with Ian yeah. McKellar, but there's a big battle sequence that we did in Battersea Power Station. It's a street, yeah, like a street battle, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we had, you know, we had the tank from Goldeneye on that because I drove it through the wall in the beginning of the, the film, mm-hmm. um, which is the opening credit sequence. And then, the, uh, uh, and, and he wanted that as a, uh, you know, very much as a master shot. It was it was a tricky thing to organise to get you know because it's got about five or six cameras on it. That was what was the word he was asking? Elaborate. Elaborate. That was mm. quite elaborate. Yeah, but some of the battle sequences that we did on on uh, Captain Corelli were quite elaborate. We had quite a lot going on there, and of course you've got a language problem because you're out there. You've got a lot of Greek extras that don't speak English. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, elaborate. The other one, of course, is the charge across the square and enemy at the gates, yeah. where I yes. had 150 Russian extras, none of whom spoke English. Probably 20 or 30 of them that were still drunk from the night before. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not kidding you. And um, and I had them running across with explosions in the ground. And I had stuntmen in amongst them, but I had to put the explosions put them, make it very clear where the explosions were and where the stuntmen were going to take the explosive hits and, and mark them out on the ground, but where the camera couldn't actually see where the danger areas were. And mm. then to make sure that the extra didn't shoot each other. And every morning I used to take one of the Nagant rifles out and I would get all the extras round and I would put up a melon on the ground and I would put the muzzle up to this thing and vaporise the melon with a blank and then yeah. say... That's what this thing can do. If you poke it in somebody, because it's just a blank and it goes bang, it has a huge amount of thing. So that was quite an elaborate sequence. That was a that was one where I was definitely chewing my nails up to the elbow 
until mm. we got that one. That was really tricky, really tricky. One of the best parts of that film, I think. It is, yeah. Like that, yeah, it's really it's great really sequence. Epic. Um, I've always found that watermelon thing to be very affecting when you're on sets because I've, I've I did reenactment and we did our gun safety and you'd always have the guy ring out a melon and everyone was sort of perplexed and like, what the hell's he doing with a melon? Yeah, and yeah. they show you. Um, and there's a great story. And if you've heard this one, there's a great story on the set. And of, I first, uh, I first did it actually with the extras on the bridge too far. That's when I first got the idea of it. I was just about to mention that. With is it? There was a guy with the rabbit on that one too. It's in um, Sebastian Avignieri's book about being on it. There's a, he did the same with a rabbit and it really affected people. I don't remember that, but, I, you know, I went there to do Cook's Crossing, mm -hmm. the Robert Redford sequence there, and, um, and there was a lot of Dutch extras that were messing around. It was just that it was the same week that we did the jumps and they were supposed to be firing up at the guy and they were sticking the muzzle of the Mausers into the ground and then firing up at the... And I, you know, I said, oh my gosh. You know, we need to... Kind of yeah. so, so that's when I got the idea. Of, I didn't have melons in anything, but I got apples and, mm. and I just put them out there. And you know, I suppose I've got a bit of a nebulous question for you, Jim. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, what do you think makes a great stunt great? What makes something special? Now we live in a world where things can make things special electronically without getting out mm. of bed, and that's the difference. That when we did things or when I did things um, we shot them in camera and therefore the skill and therefore the risk element was very different to what it is now I mean, if you look at Fast and Furious you know kids can do make that happen in their own computer now the, 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 you know the, the clever kids that have got the right bits of software can recreate all that and so for them it's a, it's a, it's a thing if you if you said I've got a, a mate of mine who jumped out of a helicopter on skis. He skied down between these explosions. He jumped over a house and a, and a truck traveling underneath. And then he, he, he actually skied, you know, between two cars, was chased by a motorcycle and it was all in one shot and blah, 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 blah. And finishes up, uh, you know, crashing through the, the screen of a, the crashing through the window into a cafe uh, and sits down. And they go, oh, that's amazing. And he said, well, now I've got this computer program where this guy jumps out of a helicopter and goes, oh, really? Yeah. Where well, you can reproduce that, exactly. But there is a, 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 there is a texture to it, which is, which is unreal. And, and we're, we're being able to close the gap texturally to make it look almost perfect where you but start to believe that that's what's happened, that that car has done 14 rolls or whatever it is. And all this mm. has happened in a, in a computer. So compared to when I started, and when if you look at that, if you look at that that thing I told you about, Hazard of the Game on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you look at what those guys were doing in the in the twenties, I mean, they were they were proper proper stuntmen then, but yeah. they were you know killing themselves left, right, and centre for a mm. few bucks. But they were fantastic yeah. performers. And we learned a huge amount from them and thought, God, you must be mad because they didn't have the technology. They didn't have airbags and they didn't, you know, they were they were doing it into nets and things. And and there's a wonderful sequence where a guy is being, they, they want him to stand in, in a thing of a catapult and he gets fired over the walls of Paris. And he arrived at the studio and they sort of worked it out. You know, the guy's still going to land over here and put the net up. And he said, well, no, I, I wait. 130 pounds, let's put a sack of sand in there. And so, and they said, no, 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 it's a waste of time. These guys have worked it all out on paper. And he said, well, I'm not going to do it until he does. So he did the sack of sand. The thing goes right the way across the thing, smashes itself against the wall on the other side of the studio. And he said, well, there's, there goes there goes your, your theories and your slide rules all to hell, boys. Now let's start again and we'll get a yeah, whole series. Let's not do that. Sacks, work it out. <laughs> and just, you know, oh my gosh. And wow. that's the way they were doing it in those days. And us guys who were doing it in the 70s, were learning from the guys who did it from the 50s and the 60s, who a lot of them were ex-wartime commandos and all that kind of stuff, but had a fantastic grasp of kinetics mm. and what could be done. So it's a continual learning curve. But now stunt performers are doing far more on green screen to produce an effect which is sometimes almost technically impossible. You'd have to spend hundreds of thousands rehearsing that, getting everything right, whereas... A clever bloke with his, you know, keyboard and all that kind of stuff in, in an afternoon can produce it and edit it and put the music on and yeah. present it as a, as a fate accompli 
to the director. Yeah, so, so my, you know, my wife works in, 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 in like web design, things like that. And she's using Cinema 4D and she, she was showing me an animation the other day. And I thought it was I thought it was in camera. I couldn't tell the difference. So yeah, I totally, yeah. understand, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing what you can do now. But I think one of my one of my final questions is I always ask guests this if we if we're doing an interview like this as a viewer, as, as a sort of a, a, a you know, viewer of a movie, what's your favourite war film? Doesn't have to be one you've worked on. <laughs> no. <laughs> I still think All Quiet on the Western Front, the original one, is the most extraordinary film to illustrate what warfare and what all the veterans that I've spoken to, they the veterans I've spoken to all say, you know, saving private Ryan. But then you say, do you remember seeing all quiet on the Western Front? Now, the veterans that I spoke to were not um, people who'd taken part in World War I, but they absolutely recognised that combat as near as possible was, was you know, very much like it was in in that film. There's another one as a German film called West Front 1918 that was yes. made with all veterans from the First World War who knew what they were doing. And again, it's enormously gritty. It's enormously gritty. But I mean, there are so many great war films, whether it's The Cruel Sea or whether it's Ice Cold favorite, in yeah. Alley mm-hmm. or you know, uh, or Saving Private Ryan. They they, yeah. they all have a, a texture about them which makes them memorable. But I do think that All Quiet on the Western Front, the original version yeah. in 1932, whatever it was, yeah, was... It's, it's, it's very visceral. It's, when you watch that film, it's kind of surprising that it, it doesn't feel like a 1930s film. It feels no. much more modern. It does. And that's... That, that's but then you, you you see the way that it's edited mm. and you see the restrictions of the set size sometimes when they're in the trenches and you get this you get this thing where and I, it looked dirty mm. and some war films that you 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 know now I mean I thought Dunkirk to me was the worst film the worst film I've seen in 25 years the fact that it got some sort of award is totally ridiculous and the whole thing was complete bollocks as far as I was concerned our listeners will love that <laughs> the, open, yeah. the opening sequence where those guys are running towards that barricade and they get shot in the back he go, climbs over the barricade walks around the corner he's on the beach they never got to within 20 miles of the beaches the Germans they stopped and from then on it just got worse and worse worse this spitfire that must have had a trailer behind it with all the ammunition and all the, the you, you know yeah. uh, and they glided for about a week. Yep, they did. <laughs> really? Yeah, they, they did. did, yeah. And then there's, there's what's-his-face, Kenneth Branagh standing on the end of this jetty with nobody else around. But, you know, oh, total bollock. And then you t- you turn onto the beach, and there's all these sodium lamps there, and all the guys waiting in the you know, for the for the ships are all wearing all their uniforms. They look, look they just stepped out of a caravan, which they had. Mm-hmm. They've all got their rifles and their backpacks and their helmets, and they're all waiting there in line. Like they're on the trooping of the colour. And you look yeah. at a few pictures of it, the, and there's blokes wearing just a shirt. They've got gym shoes on. They've been retreating for days. They haven't had shaved. It was just bollocks. Sorry, yeah, that's one. Right. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we're on the same page with Doctor. Yeah, Coach. we are. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolute, um, complete rubbish, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But getting back to it, will be interesting to see what Netflix does with their remake of All Quiet on the Western Front that's coming out soon. I forgot um, they were doing that actually. Yeah, with uh, oh, are they? Well, with Michael Brühl, is it the, the lead actor? Oh yeah, the German. Be? Yeah, that's right. Mm, I don't know. I mean, is, it, is that being made in German then? Is it? Is it? Or is I it think a, so. I think it's a Netflix. That would be interesting because it because yeah. Dunbar only works in German. Does Brühl mm. in English? Crap. Well, Brühl, Brühl is a German well, actor, so I assume. Yeah. 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 It'd be interesting, but it would be interesting because the the, the 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 one that was, you know, that was made in the in the seventies or eighties in color with um I've forgotten his name now. Uh, one actor, uh, S. Borgnine's in it. Uh, yeah, Borgnine, that's Holmes right. In yeah, it. He was a delightful uh, man, I have to say, one of the most polite actors I've ever worked with. Um, but it was crap. I mean, it was crap. You know, one of the things. Well, it was nothing like compared to the thirties version. Black and white. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not a patch. And it has a texture patch. to it. Mm. And those people that actually have the guts to make 
black and white movie. George Clooney made a film called Good Night and Good Luck. Did you ever see that? No. It's a, tr- it's a true story based on a, a, a guy who was an American reporter who was here during World War II. He was a great Anglophile uh, whose name escapes me for the moment. But he kept on sending broadcasts back to America to essentially say, we need to be getting into the war, guys. You know, these are we're the cl- this is the closest people that we have is the Brits. Pull your finger out. Get, and, of course, America was still in its pacifist, da 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 and didn't do anything. Ed, to, Ed so, Murrow. So, you know, Ed yeah, Murrow. But Ed Murrow, thank you. Yeah. But what a magnificent film. And he, and he dared to shoot it in black and white, which made it fantastic. You know, The War Lover was made in black and white, and it worked so much better because mm. it was in black and white. You know, 12 o'clock high, black and white. It it's really a timeless worked. element to it, isn't there? Yeah. Something about that film stock that doesn't date a movie. Exactly. It, yeah, we, exactly. we always say that on the show. I think that's why those 50s, those golden age 50s British war movies, I think that's why they, they hold up, because yes, they're they not... Do. And the Rich Dunkirk, yeah. for me, was in a different league. Yeah, oh, you know, absolutely. Wells and, and, you know, all those sort of people. I know that they, were, they, they played everything in every film. Mm. But, you know, in which we serve and the cruel sea and, and films like that, where they had, a, they had a grittiness, plus they were made by and with people who'd experienced World War II. Yeah. Amazing to talk to you, Jim. And, and thank you for answering our questions. And we've learned so much i think a lot of listeners are going to come away now when they watch some of their favorite scenes and they'll and they'll know exactly what is what's going on technically behind the camera i mean i know when i watch saving private ryan again i know i'm gonna feel for you in that tank <laughs> huddling down and in that half track and in I that half track yeah, i'm gonna really <laughs> like being inside a dustbin with about five guys hitting it on the outside with baseball backs <laughs> and throwing bangers in at the same time amazing <laughs> We can all pause it now and go, did you know? <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for coming on, Jim. It's been amazing. And as always, guys, you find us on the socials, uh, on Twitter, Facebook, just search Fighting On Film will come up. And you can visit our website, fightingonfilm.com, where you can find the entire back catalogue of the podcast. Maybe you'll have a foth binge. Who knows? Thanks for joining us, everybody. We've only really scratched the surface today. I would definitely recommend picking up a copy of Pop Jim's book. Man on Fire, The Life and Other Actions of Jim Dowdle. It's well worth checking out. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Thanks everyone for listening. All the best. Bye. Bye bye.